Welcome back to the Supreme Petition. This is our nightly focus on the 2017 presidential petition uh, currently underway at the Supreme Court. I say underway because the timeline is on. And I have Dr. Linda Musumba from Kenyatta University and Kakai Kissinger, who is also a human rights lawyer. And they've been helping us to understand where we've come from. And before we took a break, Kakai, you were speaking about some of the things that have happened in the past that have got us here. And, and I could throw this to you, to you, Linda, about the Supreme Court, because we never used to have it then. Now we do. Any good reason what we learned from all these cases, why we came up with the Supreme Court as the apex court? Um, certainly, uh, of course, with the new constitution, the 2010 constitution, uh, cr the creation of the Supreme Court was uh, designed, of course, to add one more layer of appeal. Uh, for citizens uh, to be able to take certain types of cases. Not all cases uh, should end up in the Supreme Court, but uh, the Supreme Court, it's, um, having one, enables us to deal with issues of policy, for instance, in matters of justice. The Supreme Court has got the, the ability or the capability to be able to design rules, regulations, uh, be able to make rulings that are profound and that change very many aspects in society. So that is one positive thing that uh, we've seen with the Supreme Court being there. Uh, only that I think citizens do need to understand that not all cases go to the Supreme Court and that um, you know there needs to be, of course, at every level of the court system. So uh, is there a way in their, in, in, in their time, is there a way that you would say they have redefined law, jurisprudence in our country? this is profound from the Supreme Court and this is going to guide us going forward? Or are we still in a place where, well, we're yet to see some really great things coming out of there? Uh, I would, uh, apart from the 2013, you know, presidential election petition, of course, which established various things which are, are carrying us forward, including in the 2017 petition, we have the decision, the advisory opinion that was rendered by the Supreme Court on the not more than two thirds um, issue where they said that by the 27th of August, um, I believe it was two years ago, we ought to have now had uh, the not more than a law establishing the not more than two thirds agenda. Sadly, this has not been implemented, and I think it is something that is was taken to court, um, high court, gone to the court of appeal, and I believe recently I've seen that um, civil society organisations have also, you know, gone to court on on this particular issue. But yes, the Supreme Court, at least in that particular case, in my view. Uh, you know, gave us something to, uh, to move with. I think we're still waiting for other very defining, uh, very defining rulings. But then again, as I said, there's a lot, there's a lot of um, understanding that is required from the public with regard to the matters that go to the, to the Supreme Court and in which cases the Supreme Court ought to get involved in. So that when the right cases go there, then I think we'll have more and more uh, judgments being rendered that are profound. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's 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 move this along uh, a, a bit faster. Uh, Kakai, um, you were talking about this whole thing of uh, laws not being up applied retrospectively, retroactively, and all that. Um, where are we with that? Is that now a standard practice right now that if uh, a law is passed now, we cannot say, well, last year this happened, can we now use this law? It, it is a internationally and regionally recognized jurisprudence that once a law comes into effect, then it only starts operational once it's in effect. Mm -hmm. And so uh, assuming there's a crime has been prohibited under the law which comes in effect today, it means therefore that if I commit that crime from tomorrow, as long as the law has come into effect, then I'll be criminally liable for that. And therefore, I won't be liable for a crime that was committed before that law came into effect. So that is basically the jurisprudence around uh, being retrospective. And that's what was the issue in the James Orengo case, where he argued and said that this law was passed in 1991, and therefore Moi should not be allowed to vie again in 1992. And the law court said, no, you can't act retrospectively, you have to think forward. And that's how the law is and that's how the jurisprudence is. And those are some of the dynamics that, uh, that happens in the terms of, uh, of legal practice. Okay, so because we are moving closer to the end of our show, you, you won't believe it, but I would like us to focus a little bit uh, on the forward-looking uh, dimensions of this. And in 2013, we saw the whole question of Amica's 
Curie, if I mentioned and I pronounced that correctly, it sounded at the time to many people as the name of some vegetable or something. <laughs> but 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 the but the, the court did pronounce itself in, in, in some ways about how people get to join cases of this sort in that capacity. So so what do we have right now? Because we've heard, for example, um, the Attorney General is seeking to join and uh, I think is it LSK or LSK as well. So, so what, what are those parameters? Can I wake up today and go and say, I also want to join this as a friend of the court, which is what that terminology means, right? Um, Joe, in recent times, we've had the Supreme Court itself pronounce itself on the issue of amicus curiae. And um, one of the, it has given the parameters that um, define instances when we can have amicus in courts. And I think one of the most, I think the, the thread that runs through is that the Supreme Court is saying that we don't want amicus curiae to come and, and relitigate the issues that are being brought in by litigants. Meaning that if the, lit the litigants are the parties to the case, amicus curiae ought not to come in uh, to actually say the same things. But amicus curiae need to come in having read the pleadings of parties and then be able to say that we represent a certain constituency uh, that we think has no, its interests are not actually articulated in these pleadings, or that we think that the Supreme Court, the pleadings that have been presented to the court, don't actually out, outline or actually uh, tell us something about a very key issue which the amicus curiae are aware about. So in, uh, according to the Supreme Court, amicus curiae can only be advancing legal points of a type that have not been canvassed by parties. And therefore, if So amicus, can anyone join in that capacity? It's, it's only uh, legal points that can be advanced. So for instance, um, you know, people other than lawyers uh, cannot be able to, uh, you know, become amicus curiae in our country yet, but in other countries it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, so we are expecting that if we're going to have amicus this time round, that uh, amicus will be advancing uh, fine legal points about things that are not in the petition. So of what NASA. is that that someone like the AG brings, for instance? I mean, we've seen in the times past, of course, the law was different, where the, the AG actually joined the case as amicus and then terminated the whole thing. So, so in, in the circumstances that have been defined by the Supreme Court, what is that unique view, the unique perspective that comes from the Attorney General that all these many parties in this case cannot capture? I would, I would uh, say that it's premature at this point to know until the AG is able to file his papers. Then but but typically know. given, I mean, but typically given where the AG comes from, yeah. what would be those things you know, that the AG brings to the table that are likely to miss out in all the different uh, pleadings exactly. that, that come you know, One court. of the things that we, we, we missed in the 2013 petition, and we got it wrong, is to allow the amicus, the friend of the court, to take a center stage in terms of adding value by, uh, by almost prosecuting the case. What we ought to have done at that point was to allow Amicus, and tell Amicus, the friend of the court, give us, look at the pleadings, give us what you think are points of law that will decide or will guide this court in terms of coming to a, a, a good decision. Now, leave all the matters of evidence for the parties. Only focus, that's the work of Amicus, only focus on the points of law. The things that completely stand out that will somehow guide the court in terms of writing the judgment. Now that's what we did not get so much in 2013. I'm hoping in this petition we will have Amicus, if they are allowed to come on record, because those will be determined during the pre-trial conference. If they are allowed to come on record, in fact they ought not address the court. They should be allowed to come on record, but then provide written submissions to the court. Because remember, you have less than six days. You want to give the parties to the dispute a humble time and enough time. So Amicus only says, I've looked at the petitioners and I've looked at the respondents' people, uh, pleadings, and I think this is the jurisprudence of deciding electoral petition, and this court should be decided or should be guided by the known principles. And some of those principles, we all know them in terms of the law. That is the work of Amicus. So, so, so looking at the quality of what the lawyers will be doing that, and, and Dr. Musumba, you've written a, a, a bit about this, and um, 
balancing the scales of electoral justice and talking about the quality of what you call lawyering, what the lawyers do there. What, what are some, because I mean, a lot of us were bombarded with all manner of things. They're like, okay, what are these people talking about? How, how, how do you imagine that this is going to play out with the lawyers? What, what, what is that that we expect as people who consume whatever is going to happen in those courts during that week or so? Uh, of course, we have to remember that um, once the parties have filed their pleadings, and which, of course, they should have done by tomorrow, that means that everything you want to say has got to be in, 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 the, in the pleadings. So that there is uh, whatever you'll be saying orally, you'll simply be conversing what's in the pleadings. But the oral arguments are very, very important because then they add the extra element of persuasion. Uh, they, they add the element of explanation, and therefore how lawyers go about their business is very, very important. One, of course, um, it is the coherence that uh, a lawyer brings on board. It is the way a lawyer is able to meticulously uh, argue, the, argue the case, the way in which a lawyer is able to try to their utmost best to hold the attention of, of the persons who are listening. Because, um, uh, you know, judges are human beings. I don't want to go so much into, you know, the details of that. But then it is important that lawyers are able to engage you mean so like that they're able to represent you can bore the judges, you mean? Well, to put yeah, plainly. it's possible to bore the judges, <laughs> yeah, and you want them to hear everything that you're saying. Okay. But yeah. also to add on that is that we've said before that uh, electoral election uh, presidential petitions are sui generis. They are very unique uh, cases. What does that mean? Sui generis. Sui generis. Means it's, it's in a class of their own. It's in a class of their own. It's a it's a rare breed. Okay. Of, 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 of cases because we have two main cases one is either a criminal case or it's a civil case but over the years petitions have developed its own class so we call it sui generis a very interesting character now what the lawyers will also be doing they'll be guided by three principles the issue of shifting the burden of proof and proving and making the arguments around burden of proof and the standard of proof now in civil cases the standard of proof is known in uh, criminal cases, the standard of proof is known. Whatever the evidence the lawyers will be having in this petition, they either they must prove them, because the 2013 petition said that, uh, that uh, the outcome was that uh, the burden of proof and the standard of proof is beyond the, the balance of convenience. It's a little bit higher in electoral petition cases. And what is that? Higher meaning that it's, you know, you, you can prove your case between a balance of probability in civil cases. When it comes to criminal cases, it's beyond proving a case doubt. beyond, yeah. uh, beyond um, uh, reasonable doubt. Yeah. But in an uh, in election petition, it is a standard higher than the civil case. It's a little bit higher. Now, the challenge then is, should there be a, a, a petition or a ground that hinges on issues of criminality? For example, fraud or something, whatever that will come out of these issues, then the burden of proof completely shifts to the petitioner. He must prove that beyond reasonable doubt, even in election petition. Oh, because it then would be a crime. It, it will be a crime. So even in election petition now, the jurisprudence has changed that, that you must, if there's a, a fraud or element of fraud, then you must prove it beyond reasonable doubt. So those standards will keep on shifting, depending on the evidence that are there. So what I'm saying is that the evidence or the burden of proof in electoral petition is extremely high, and the entire responsibility lies on the petitioner. Mm -hmm. uh, Gladwell seems to have a problem with that. There's too much burden placed on, on the petitioner. Well, it's a general principle that uh, the person who alleges something must prove it. Uh, we've had uh, the announcement by the chair of the IABC of a winner of these elections. If you're going to try to overturn that, then surely you must have the evidence sufficient to displace that announcement. Mm. Now, there are people who have been... Uh, wondering because uh, the nature of this is that the court may have to sit on every single day and um, I mean the Chief Justice has said many times Saturday not for him what is it with the quorum and all of these things in the Supreme Court can this case start for example without him can the other judges sit if for example it falls on the first day of the hearing as some people suppose it might the, when you look at the, the Supreme Court Act and the Supreme Court rules of 2017, uh, Supreme Court, depending on the nature of cases that uh, Dr. Linda was taking us through, uh, a bench can be of, of, of uh, two people, two judges, depending on the nature of the dispute before it. 
and it can keep shifting depending on whatever uh, the nature. But when it comes to presidential petition, the law says it must be five judges. Five judges must hear that dispute. You do recall that in 2013, we had six judges hearing the petition because the seventh judge was not in office. So five judges. So don't expect all the seven uh, judges who are now sitting to be there. However, in the event that during the pre-trial conference, lawyers, and I expect this, lawyers will come up with arguments uh, and say, we want all the judges to sit. Then, then they will be required to sit because they will make a decision whether we should all seven sit. But remember, they're not bound to sit the seven. I also expect something will happen, and this the court has to deal with, when the lawyers decide that we want every single judge in the Supreme Court, if you are all sitting seven, we want all of you to write your own judgments. Now, this did not happen in, in 2013, and I'm suspecting the lawyers are going to push that we want every judge to write the opinion. But how is, that, that how, is, is that, would the court be bound by that? If lawyers said, well, we want every judge, because we've had even politicians talk about that anyway, no one knows what impact that has. But can the lawyers actually have any kind of, uh, uh, when, they, when they say we want every judge to write his, her own judgment, does that mean anything? Or the judges can do whatever they want anyway? You know, when you look at the reasoning behind the establishment of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court was established so that they are, they, the, the, the value there is to give uh, high-class jurisprudence. And therefore, the whole issue was that the judges are going to channel out uh, decisions that are of first class in nature and shaping the jurisprudence of the country. That is the whole epitome of the Supreme Court. So I don't think that it will be a bad idea for the lawyers to ask that every judge has to issue their own decision, because that's when you come into issues of the, the decision of the court and the dissents that are there. But what normally takes the, the, the opinion is the majority. So if there are five of them and three, three judges uh, decide to swing the one direction, then that becomes the judgment. If you have four judges dissenting completely and one judge ruling against a different party, then the dissent becomes the judgment of the court. So it all depends. It will be very interesting, pre-trial pre -trial conference will be very interesting because the standards that are going to be set there are going to be extremely oh. high and they'll be bound by the court. All right, we need, we, need, we need to finish. So, Dr. Musumba, this, uh, you, you'll take this home. And what I'll ask you is, as a legal scholar, a case like this obviously presents exciting opportunities for learning something or seeing something. What are you looking forward to in general terms from this entire petition, from perhaps even a scholarly standpoint? Um, for sure, these are interesting times for uh, students, uh, you know, in electoral law, in uh, uh, and uh, students of different disciplines. So I think it's a very exciting time for them to be able to learn. And for me, I'm looking forward to seeing what the court's philosophy will be uh, in, you know, in this matter. So either before or after or during, I hope that we are going to be able to learn the philosophy of deciding, you know, election petitions that it will come through. And that we'll also be able to, to you know, to learn, um, you know, the extent to which the law, as as it's as, as as it exists, for example, in the constitution, what extent should we give to how how much weight should we give to qualitative evidence or qualitative issues versus quantitative? Quantitative, of course, being the issues of counting, tabulating, and that sort of thing, and qualitative being the issues that are that reflect or come through in the Constitution as, as, as the things that we have agreed as Kenyans that we'd like to see during an electoral Free, fair, process. Very fair, very and all yes. of those things. All right, thank you very much. That's a good place to end it. You've been watching the Supreme Petition, and as I mentioned, this is our weekly, our nightly focus on this week that we have this presidential petition rolling over into next week when we'll begin to see the full hearing happening at the Supreme Court. We'll meet again tomorrow night, same time. Have a good night. My name is Joe Gale. God bless you. Jurisdiction. This is the authority given by law to a court to try cases and rule on legal matters within a particular geographic area and or over certain types of legal cases. The Supreme Court of Kenya has jurisdiction to hear a presidential petition.